what is even more important than no knowing how to program is the problem solving skills that computer science uh, teaches its students. Hi, my name is Hebi Chan Zheng from TowardsDataScience.com. Today I have with me Dr. Jeanette Wing, who is a distinguished Evanescence Director of Data Science Institute at Columbia University. She's also the professor of computer science at the same institution. She's joining us all the way from New York. So thanks for being here today. You're welcome. All right, can we start with your professional background? Can you tell us your professional background? Okay, um, I was starting with my education. I got all my degrees uh, in computer science from MIT. So my bachelor's, master's and PhD. And then from there, I went to the University of Southern California for two years on the faculty. And from there, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where I was for many years, um, almost three decades, uh, in computer science. I was uh, head of the computer science department twice. Um, and in between my two stints as department head, I was at the National Science Foundation uh, in the United States. It's a funding agency for all basic science and engineering and research. And I was in charge of the computer and information science and engineering directorate. So I oversaw the funding for academic research and computer science for the country. Um, I, after um, my second stint as department head at Carnegie Mellon University, I went to Microsoft and I was corporate vice president of Microsoft Research uh, for four and a half years. And then I most recently joined Columbia University about two years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, to run the Data Science Institute. Great. Um, so I'd love to start at that juncture, actually, when you, when you transitioned to Microsoft. So you said you worked in Microsoft Research as the corporate vice pres uh, president from yeah. 2013 to 2017, if I'm getting that correct. Right. Um, so what motivated that transition from being the head of the Carnegie Mellon's computer science department to joining Microsoft later on? Well, joining Microsoft was really uh, running uh, Microsoft Research, which is probably the largest computer science department in the universe. Um, at the time, there were about a thousand PhDs in computer science. So it was really quite a, a, a wonderful opportunity to work with cutting edge researchers, but in an industrial setting, which is very different from an academic setting. Although I would say Microsoft Research is much more um, academic than a typical industrial research lab. So it was a wonderful opportunity to, for me to work both at the cutting edge of research in computer science, but also do it in a, in a corporate setting, in a, a setting where it's, it's about you know, um, the industry and the business. What were your main responsibilities at the Microsoft Research as a corporate vice president? I was in charge of the basic research labs. So it was really about pushing state of the art in um, all fields of research. And by then, uh, Microsoft Research was covering more than just computer science. We had economists and social scientists. We had biologists. We had um, all sorts of uh, people, not just computer scientists. Um, it was also about um, uh, you know, speaking to the core business of Microsoft and making sure that um, great technology that Microsoft researchers produced were available uh, to the business units and actually ensuring that the business units would always be um, you know, one step ahead um, in, in terms of the technology, but also anticipating the future. Um, and and uh, so those are the main you know, responsibilities of any corporate research lab. And I was in charge of all of that. <laughs> So I actually oversaw multiple labs around the world. There was one in Redmond, one in New York City, one in New England, one in Cambridge, England, one in Bangalore, India. And for a time, I also oversaw the lab in Beijing, in, in, um, in China. Uh, do these different labs at different locations from China to India, do they uh, specialize in particular research or are they very much interconnected in terms of their research design? Well, the labs are, each one has a, their unique character. Um, each lab has certain strengths. Um, and, uh, but overall, if you put it together, it was really about promoting and pushing state of the art of research and ensuring that the business units um, were always, you know, one step ahead. 
I think that the, so, so as I said, each lab had its own culture and um, not all labs are the same size. So the larger labs were able to cover more territory than the smaller labs. I see. Uh, does Microsoft Research play a, any role in the data ecosystem, particularly related to data science and machine learning? And if so, can you give us some specific examples? Well, I think Microsoft Research, as many other um, companies more generally, when you think about the IT companies like uh, Google and Facebook and Amazon, and also in China, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, what the companies have um, that really is related to data science, machine learning, and AI is they have the data and they have the compute power. Uh, so these are two resources that academics tend to not have. They don't have the data. The data is locked up in the companies. And they don't have large data centers um, with large GPU clusters and FPGAs and tensor uh, processing units and in, at the scale that any academic institution could have. So they play, these companies and the research arms of these companies play a very important role in actually making advances in today's world of machine learning and AI. And machine learning and AI are just the analysis techniques in the broader scope of data science. So they play a, a, an incredibly important role. They're also showing, I think, society how these techniques can be used for real systems, whether it's recommending what movie to watch or what book to um, buy or predicting whether you know, you're gonna have cancer or not. You know, there's a range of applications that uh, AI and machine learning uh, is already uh, 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 lighting up, but also promises to light up for the future. Uh, were you personally involved in Microsoft's investments in machine learning and in AI? Uh, if so, can you tell us uh, some opportunities and challenges that you faced during this process? Well, um, I was definitely involved in investing in the research in machine learning and AI and, and data science more generally uh, in terms of the people that we hired and the projects that we supported um, and also the, our engagements with the business units. So I was in a, a business unit called AI and Research. And so I was the R part of AI and Research, but we were obviously the AI part of that business unit worked with all the other business units to make sure that all the other business units were aware of the latest AI techniques, machine learning techniques, um, and how to take advantage of the uh, research ideas that were coming out from the research arm of the company. Uh, you know, I would love to go deeper into this relationship between, you know, research institutions, private sector, and uh, perhaps the public sector as well. So can you comment on perhaps this intricate relationship among these different players and, and maybe how they impact the wider society? Well, I think it's important, you know, the way I think about it is what I call the academia government industry ecosystem. Um, and I, I think especially for information technology and computer science, this ecosystem is very delicately balanced. If you start at any point of that circle, and it is one of these virtual circles, let's start with academia. What does academia produce? Academia produces people and ideas. So all the students that we graduate go out into the workforce. They go out to work for Microsoft or Facebook or Google um, or, um, or the government. And they take the, uh, all the learnings that, that they got from being a student. Um, and, you know, basically, these are usually state of the art uh, ideas and start, you know, working their way up the ladder in corporate America, let's say. So, um, so those ideas then get perpetuate, um, prop propagated through the companies that they're working for. So that's how the circle goes. Um, academia produces people and ideas. Industry takes people and ideas and produces money. Um, some of that money goes to the government, and some of that money then goes to fund basic research, which funds academic research. So do you see how that all works? Speaking more deeply about your own academic um impact. You know, your side is one of the one who originated and popularized the idea of computational thinking. 
uh, to the computer science educational community. So what is computational thinking, and how has this idea evolved since your essay on the subject in 2006? Well, so computational thinking is the thought processes for formulating a problem and expressing its solutions in a way that a computer, be it a human or a machine, can effectively carry out. So that's how I define computational thinking. It's a loaded definition, um, and each of the words is quite important. But the way to more intuitively understand what computational thinking is, it's thinking like a computer scientist. So there are certain techniques and uh, ways of problem solving that computer scientists do on a daily basis, whether it's thinking about how do I design an algorithm to solve this problem, or how do I decompose this problem into smaller pieces? How do I define the layers of abstractions? How do I define the interfaces between components? All of that kind of stuff we do on a daily basis as computer scientists. And I think it's this collection of problem solving techniques and collection of ways in which one approaches you know, a, a big system or a, a big problem, that is what I mean by thinking like a computer scientist. And so it's the, the a collection of all of those ideas that go into computational thinking. Um, the point of the 2006 article um, was actually uh, twofold. One is, I don't, you're probably too young to, to know this, in 2006, uh, around 2004, 2005, we were just coming off the dot com, um, com bust. And so, you know, everyone was actually fleeing computer sciences, science. So many undergraduate institutions were seeing a decline in enrollments in computer science. And people were worried. Um, people were worried about whether they should shut down the computer science department. So one reason I wrote the article was to tell ourselves as computer scientists that we don't have anything to worry about. These things go in cycles. Moreover, we have a way of thinking that's beneficial to everyone, whether you're in computer science or not. And so one of the purposes of that article was to say computer science is for all. Now, it's a little wordy to say that, so I just used, and also, I didn't mean that everyone had to major in computer science. I meant that everyone could benefit from some concepts that computer science offers, the thinking concepts, and that's why I use the phrase computational thinking. The other point of the article was, at the time, introductory courses to computer science were pretty much introduction to Java programming or introduction to C++, or introduction to your favorite programming language. And it turned off a lot of students who wanted just a taste of computer science, who wanted to understand what does computer science offer. So I was also writing that article for us in the computer science community to say, we have so much more to offer in terms of teaching computer science than how to program. In fact, how to program is just a skill that you learn to be a computer scientist. What is even more important than no knowing how to program is the problem solving skills that computer science uh, teaches its students. And those problem solving skills are even more important than knowing how to program if you're not going to be a computer scientist. So I was telling the computer science community, we need to change our introductory courses to be more about the concepts in computational thinking um, and less about computer science equals computer programming. And so that's the, the point of the article. And since then, not only has that interface uh, on both sides changed, but also there's been much more discussion of how to incorporate computer science into K through 12 education around the world, not just in the US. Going back to your current position, what compelled you to join Columbia University as the professor of science and the director of Data Science Institute? Um, and why Columbia specifically? Well, Columbia is a full-fledged university. It's got everything all professional schools, all the disciplines you can imagine. And my view of data science is that 
everyone has data. Everyone can benefit from, from data science. Um, and it's also my Trojan horse for ensuring that everyone learns computational thinking. Because of obviously, one of the first things you learn in uh, data science is programming in Python and R and really being very computationally uh, adept. So why Columbia? Columbia is a full-fledged university. It's also in a great city, the great, great, greatest city in the world. Um, and I really wanted to be in a university where there was a lot of intellectual stimulation not just uh, in computer science and engineering and data science, but in law and business and journalism and medicine um, and social work, all the strengths of a great university uh, really uh, Columbia offers. Actually, I want to take a step back uh, for our audience who might not be so familiar. Uh, can you tell us what exactly is the Data Science Institute? Okay, the Data Science Institute at Columbia is actually university-wide and a university-level institute. So it works with every school on campus and all the other institutes and centers on campus. Um, and this really goes to speak uh, uh, to my point that data is everywhere and everyone can benefit from uh, uh, analyzing the data they have. So we work with the history of faculty and English faculty. We work with teachers. We work with clearly everyone in the medical school, whether they're studying genomics or they're studying population behavior, public health. Um, we work with the law school and business school. We work with everyone across campus. And it's um, also university level in that I actually report to the president of the university. So I don't report to any one dean. Um, the Data Science Institute really sits on top of all the different schools and the entire university structure. Uh, the Data Science Institute has a three-part mission statement, which I think will convey the ambition that I have for the institute. So the first is advance the state of the art in data science. And this is really about pushing the state of the art, pushing basic research. And for data science, it's also about defining the field. It's a new emerging field. The academic community is still trying to figure it out. What is this data science thing anyway? And so I'd like Columbia to take the lead in helping to define what data science is. The second part of the mission statement is to transform all fields, professions, and sectors through the application of data science. And this really speaks to the full-fledged nature of Columbia University. Um, we represent all fields, professions, and sectors, and everyone has data. So I can see the transformation actually happening under my nose. And the last part of my mission statement is to ensure the responsible use of data to benefit society. So this is to benefit society is to really tackle those societal grand challenges like healthcare and climate change and energy and social justice. And the responsible use of data speaks to the ethical and privacy concerns in collecting data and analyzing data, especially data about people, data about us. Um, and I think it's really important for data science as a new emerging field to emphasize the ethical concerns about data, something that computer science missed the boat on. And I think with data science, we can get this right from day one. So I summarize this large mission statement into three words, data for good, data to do good for society, and using data in a good manner. And that's responsible use. And so data for good is really the mantra that I've been promoting for the Data Science Institute at Columbia University. In addition to this mission for, uh, regarding the data for good, uh, what are some of the research developments and programs that the Institute is participating or leading? Uh, can you give us some specific examples on those? Well, so the, let me speak um, specifically about um, the programs that we are putting on, but also maybe some of the interesting research results that have come out of the work that the Data Science Institute does. So programmatically, we run a faculty recruiting program, a postdoc fellows program. We run a, a DSI scholars program, which provides research opportunities for undergraduates and master's students. Um, we, I run a seed grants program, which funds small grants for collaborations uh, across campus. Um, and I am also, we run various seminar series for people, for industry to come and talk to our students, um, and also for technical talks for our uh, advanced students and, and faculty. 
Um, and also we have a data for good seminar series that spoke speaks uh, the direct uh, about uh, about ethical and um, privacy concerns. Um, we we run a lot of events on on campus can make uh, where we convene lots of different groups of faculty who are interested in particular areas of, of uh, discussion. We also loosely structure ourselves around some themes. So we have a Foundations of Data Science Center, which uh, speaks to the, um, the Foundations of Data Science, where at Columbia, we uniquely define the foundations drawing from three pillars of strength, computer science, statistics, and operations research. So Columbia has very strong OR, both in the engineering school and in the business school. And so we have a, a, a very um, solid foundation of data science effort um, that looks into things like causal reasoning, algorithms and data trade-offs, um, and just the science of like deep learning and machine learning, all these questions that we don't know have answers to. Um, we also have thematics. Um, so we have a health analytics center, a business and data, a business and financial uh, analytics center. We have a cybersecurity center. Um, we have a sensor on sense, um, sensors um, that you know collect a lot of data. Um, so that's more at the physical layer. Um, we have a center on smart cities because that's a vertical that's very in, uh, of interest, especially in New York City. Um, and um, so all of so all of that is very general, and, and um, but there are specific research results that I can cite. I give a whole talk about this, so you don't want me to do that. Um, but we have, for instance, most recently in causal reasoning, we have a result that talks about how one can do multiple causal reasoning in a way that has weaker assumptions than single causal reasoning. Um, and multiple causal reasoning happens to be much more prevalent in the real world than uh, just single causal reasoning. Then we have um, applications in uh, research uh, that show how data science can be applied to almost any domain. So we have people working in biology and uh, history, as I mentioned, in astronomy, um, in material science, um, you know, in medicine. Um, we also have some very interesting data sets. So probably the most interesting data set that we have is something called Odyssey. And this is 500 million unique patient records. So these are all EHRs, electronic health records, all in the same format from uh, data sets from around the world. 25 different countries are involved, 80 different clinics are involved. And once you have 500 million unique uh, um, you know, patient records, you have many observations, and you can start discovering new science and new science questions from observational data alone, no clinical trials. Um, and we've already made some interesting discoveries that ask, actually raise uh, the need for do, new experiments uh, in the medical science. So that's a very interesting data set that we coordinate here at Columbia, um, but it is, is, is a federated data set that obviously involves many people from around the world. Uh, as a final question, do you have any words of wisdom for our data science community, uh, especially regarding the topic of ethics in AI and data science, which I think is not talked about as often, but it's definitely seminal to the work that data scientists do as a whole? Yes, it's actually quite important. So what we're learning is that very, people are very excited about AI and machine learning uh, applied to almost everything, whether it's um, making recommendations as to what books to buy or movies to watch, but also in the computer vision systems that are in our self-driving cars. Um, also making uh, predictions about uh, or, or classifications for medical diagnosis and treatment. Now, when we're talking about movie recommendations and book recommendations, it's probably okay if we get it wrong. Um, we're not going to upset the end user. But when we're talking about self-driving cars, when we're talking about medical uh, diagnoses, we need to make sure that the systems are correct, reliable, safe, secure, um, and also um, you know, ethical and, and fair. So many... Um, 
so, so another whole area of application that is already being uh, AI is already being used for is making decisions about um, whether someone should get bail or not, or making decisions about whether to hire you or not. Now, you want all of those decisions to be fair. But if the models are being trained on biased data, then the models are going to be biased. And that's not fair. So all of a sudden, these machine learning models are being used in safety critical, life critical situations, in making decisions about people, and those decisions are going to affect us for life. Um, we want to make sure that these, these models are fair, that they, we can trust the outcome. Um, and right now, there's actually no good reason to trust anything. Um, so I am actually promoting a whole area what, uh, in what I call trustworthy AI to look at safety, security, reliability, fairness, robustness, all sorts of these kinds of properties for the particular machine learning model in context and uh, per task, per domain. I think it's something that we are just scratching at the surface in terms of how to even define these properties, let alone you know, prove that any sort of machine learning model satisfies any of those properties. Uh, that's where the research has to go. And if we don't get there, um, then there's no reason that people or society should actually trust any of these um, automated systems, right? Would you trust your doctor um, who just told you you have cancer um, if, it was, if that diagnosis was based purely on what the machine said? I think you would you would probe your doctor a little more. Thank you for those insights, and I'm really looking forward to your initiative. And that's all the time that we have for today. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you again.